Praise the Lord. Let's take our, our Bibles and turn to the 14th chapter, excuse me, the 15th chapter of Corinthians. And today we're going to look at verses 12 through 34. Would you stand with me one more time as we honor God's word together? Give thanks to him for it. But if I preach that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have tested, testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost if only for this life we hope, we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with more, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat drink, for tomorrow we die. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Father, I praise you and thank you for the word, this word from heaven once delivered to us. I thank you for the servant who was moved along by your spirit inspired to write exactly what the Spirit of God wanted to be written. And I pray, Lord, you would help us today as we take up this text and recognize that the resurrection of Jesus is not only just an important thing to know about or something to know about, but is the central thing that we rest our entire faith upon. And our generations before us have rested their entire faith upon is Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead. And we give you thanks, Lord, as we examine ourselves. Do we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? In Jesus' name we pray. Prepare our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is a wonderful text. It follows along in a long exposition that Paul starts all the way in verse 1. And he goes all the way into the just a moment. 54th verse. So you can see why we're not doing it all in what time in one time. Although he certainly did. And I hope that one of the things that you will do when we go home and you, during this week is you'll read this whole chapter, all 54 verses. Just read it straight through, maybe a couple times, so that you can see the connections and the way in which Paul has come from this basic premise, this basic premise in the first chapter where he presents three essential truths of the gospel. In verse 1, in verse 2, I guess it is, that death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, I want to have you remember as a last thing and a first essential thing that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And we touched that and we, we looked at that in, in detail. And you've heard that be, being said by me over and over and over again, haven't you? And when we think in terms of we only have a moment to talk to somebody, what should we say to them? Just read this scripture to them. Do you believe that? As I've asked so many people that. It's a very short statement. Do you believe that? And it is amazing the number of people that will say, even in, on death's door, I don't believe it. But I've also seen people, even in the latest moments of their life, who rejected it again and again and again and again. And that God's mercy, he drew them, even at the last moments of their life, to say, yes, I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I do believe he died for my sins. I do believe he was buried. And we think, well, good grief, that's, you know, that's just, they're just saying that because they want to say that. Well, they do want to say it, and it's true. They do want to say it. And um, to sit there and think that they, well, they lived a terrible life. Well, what kind of life have you been leaving, leading? You know, we, we're ne none of us to the point where we, are now just ready to go to heaven because we have been faithful all the years. No, we all are dependent upon this work of grace. We've already received everything we can receive. There's nothing to be added to it. We, we rise in the morning and think, well, I've got to do something. I've got to do this. I've got to do the other thing. I've got to stop doing that. I've got to start doing this. Stop that. You rise in the morning, you should turn your face toward heaven and say, thank you, Lord, that you are satisfied with the death of Christ Jesus, with his burial and his resurrection, you're satisfied and I have peace with God. That should be the thing that lingers in our minds. So often we have the, the devil who says, you know, you didn't read your Bible yesterday and day before, three days before that and five days before that. You know, you, you know what kind of Christian are you? <laughs> I'm a Christian who's saved by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the kind of Christian I am. As a result, we see Paul laboring here, laboring with something. We don't really know specifically. There's a lot of indications. We're going to look at those in, as we begin here this morning. Why is it that he's talking about the resurrection to these people? Well, it's certainly not just to say, I want to remind you persons who have never thought, forgot about this, just keep this on your, in your mind. Just as you go, I just want to give you this one thing as you go. I doubt that, and I think that he falls right in the line of all the things that Paul has addressed in this, in this chapter, or in this book, this whole letter. And so we think of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a foundational structure, foundational structure of the Christian faith. You'll, you'll hear people say, Everything in Christianity hinges upon the door of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every cult, that American cults, every American cult rejects this truth. What, what hope is there for that person, those persons? 
And they lead their children to believe that. They believe their community that they may pastor or they're part of to believe that. They spread it in newspapers all over the thing. Draw people in. I had one person, as we were talking about this subject, who's, in a, who's a leader in a cult, and he said to me, what you're saying is very convincing, and if you were to say this to people that are just part of, just coming into our church, they would believe you, and you would, you would have success in leading them away. He said, however, if we have them for six months, they will never believe this. You'll never turn them. I thought, man, I feel like I'm talking to the devil. And I think I was talking to somebody who was controlled by him. If Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead, his suffering on the cross, his burial, would have included him among those persons who through history have been examples of greatness and honor. But his resurrection from the dead places him into a category which no other person has ever before been and no one since has achieved this either. In the history of the whole world, and it bonifies the truth of his mission and his message, of his person, his mission and his message. So it's a serious thing. And Paul's leaving it for last, and he, he gives it more space than anything else he's talked about so far. 58 verses. How did the Christian church drift from the teaching of the resurrection? Well, let's just do a little examination. The origins seem pretty clear to me. In the early portions of a letter, chapter 1, verse 12, they were divided and quarreling. You think division and quarreling doesn't cause people to drift, take sides, focus on a person and their viewpoint versus upon the person and viewpoint of Christ? We've done it. We quarrel and get in tangles. I call it getting a knot in your tail. If you're a cat, of course. Get a knot in your tail. It's not, not going to ruin you. But you get a knot in your tail. And it's this normative truth, this greatness of this subject. If we just do something like stop reading our Bible or we neglect something in our Christian, we get mad at somebody and don't forgive them, we, you know, there's a host of things we could do on that level. If we get into those things, you don't lose your salvation over those. You don't stop being a Christian over those things. They're all repairable. It's a matter of just taking time and stop and just untangle things and get that out of your life. But if we neglect or miss the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're not even saved. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. And they were divided and they're quarreling. As he said in chapter 1, verse 12, if you would follow along with me. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. More like, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. In what? Because, was it because of their message or because of their person? Paul was... He said he wasn't eloquent. He wasn't a great preacher. He wasn't someone that people would like just by listening to him. But it was the power of his message that he emphasized. They were divided about who they liked best. They were boastful. Chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. It is because of him you are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. They're more interested in boasting about the preacher they like. They were spiritually immature. In, this, in chapter 3, verse 2, 
I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. They were immature. Looking at Christianity on a small me level. We all do that too. We have had that tendency. We still have a tendency. The me level. I never, I rarely get up in the morning. Of course, if I'm having trouble with somebody else, but I get up and I, I look in the mirror and I say, I have a problem with them. And I, I can even look at myself in the mirror and say, I have a problem with them and no one can blame me. And eventually I think, God has a problem with you. Because <laughs> it, it's me. It's what I'm thinking about. What's going on in my mind. I'm immature. It's, there's an immaturity that rises up. They were deceived. They were unwise. They were unspiritual in chapter 3, 18 and 19. Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. They were unwise and unspiritual. They said they were arrogant. Some of you have become arrogant. As if he was not coming again. And I was not coming to you, he says. They were also thinking of themselves as Paul's equal in understanding of every teaching he had. Chapter 4, verse 15. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. And finally, they were all talk. Chapter 4, 20 and 21. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, a matter of food but a matter of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? To drift or be distracted from the behavior of the Christian faith is a big problem. It is. Big problems. Being drifted into bad habits, drifted into bad behavior. It's a big problem. But to underestimate or misunderstand or not understand the message of the resurrection is to miss the object reality of the Christian faith and the power of salvation that comes by the preaching of the gospel. Paul said we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves servants for your sake. And he said in, the, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you know this? For therein is the power of God. Just speaking it presents a power that the Holy Spirit uses to awaken dead person, uninterested people, people who are slumbering in this world, and awakens them to new life and new faith and belief. That's the introduction. Just to give you some context, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the indelible, unchanging foundation of the gospel. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, which I talked about in the very beginning. For, we, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. I would highly encourage you to memorize that text. If you don't need anything else in the Bible, and you don't have time to teach somebody, you don't have time to take somebody through a discipleship course. You might, have, you might have just a moment to say that verse. There's a verse that really encourages me. The verse that I just, if I'm, I'm a Christian as a Christian, it really just kind of sets me free to know what it's all about to be a Christian. And you quote that verse. You're not saying, there's a, there's, there's a verse I want to tell you because you need it, man, woman. You need it because you're a sinner. You need this verse. <laughs> you know, the point, I, I, I got a really good friend. He likes to, when he talks, like to do this. Why not you? And I sometimes say, you know, breakfast, I said, put that away, please. I don't want that. <laughs> 
resurrection of Jesus Christ is the indelible and changing foundation of the gospel. Another contextual thought, all of the truths Paul has taught in this letter were universally believed and taught. Remember how at the end of the last time he made this distinction with all those witnesses, all those persons who witnessed, and then he said, we all preach the same thing everywhere. That wasn't only just true of those persons who were witnesses, but he starts this in the very beginning of his letters. He says in the second verse of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. To all those everywhere. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in the church. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, talking about marriage, just as God has called you to, to them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do all the churches of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. This is the truth everywhere Christianity is properly taught. These truths that he's teaching. 1 Corinthians 3, 21. The objective truths of the gospel were taught by Paul, not only just by all the witnesses, but by Paul and all the apostles. Cephas and Apollos that he mentioned in the very first section of the book. So then no more boasting about leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or the life or death or the future or the present, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is in God. I am in, he's saying, I am in absolute sync step with Apollos and Cephas that you have divided yourself over and are arguing about and boasting about. And here in 15th chapter in verse 11, doesn't leave it out here either, whether then it is they or I, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. This is the context is 1 Corinthians. Of course, he's the witnesses he's talking about, but there's also the context of the, where he started. When they're arguing over Cephas, I am of Cephas, I am of Paul, I am of Christ. Well, this is what we preach. Cephas, Paul, what Christ preaches, preached. And this is what you believed. This is why you believed. You ever, you ever missed that? I hope, I hope if you've missed this idea, that this becomes so important to you. I think I probably say this in my life with people just dozens and dozens of times. When there's a person that you're wondering about, you know, and I think that we've, we wonder about people, where they're really at. I had a brother-in-law that, my dear sister's second husband. And this, he was a really nice guy. Everybody would like this guy. Everybody would like James. He can get along with anybody. Literally. He can throw darts with you. He can drink with you. He can talk about theology with you. He can do all kinds of things. He'll listen and he just adds some little thing. But everybody's worried about James. Everybody's worried about James. They didn't tell me I'm here to do something, go get James saved, you know. But James and I were driving to, from Bowling Green to Nashville, and um, I was talking to him about some of the things that are on my mind, and he was listening and adding a little bit here and there, and I said, I said, you know, I, I just, I wonder about things. I wonder if um, people really grasp the center of Christianity and I said, you know, for example, Paul said that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. I said, James, do you believe that? 
Yes, I do, he said. Yes, I do. I believe that. He didn't say it for when I was a little boy. He just says, I believe that. Christ died for my sins. He was buried. And my, of course, he doesn't go into this kind of, but buried. And then he rose from the dead. I believe it. <laughs> I told my sister that and she just wept. I didn't go out there and you know, put him on the ropes. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just asked him if he believed it. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to believe. I, there's uh, one of the things, one of the big arguments, or not the big thing. I love contemporary worship. I love all hymns. And, and both in hymns and worship, you always hear bad theology sometimes. At least in my opinion. And I hope the Chris, I think in the scripture's opinion. <laughs> and people like to quote this one. Um, Jesus said, do you believe? He says, Lord, help my unbelief. So, you know, we love to quote that one. Well, I'm just trying to believe. I'm just trying to believe. Well, in what? What do you mean you're trying to believe? What is it you're trying to believe in? This is the core of our belief. Paul knows it. And he is willing in this letter to spend a large amount of time articulating this. And today he is going to seek to assure the Corinthians and us of the truth of, these, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he begins in verse 12. But, now, by the way, this, this, these first few verses, they're, they're, they're kind of like Pauline, you know. You look at the seventh chapter of um, Romans. I, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, let's see, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, I don't want to do. So if I do the things I don't want to do, or if I want to do the things I you know, and, he, and he does this, this like five sentences. Do, don't, do, don't, don't, do, don't, do, don't, do. And before you long, you're saying, well, I'm, I'm kind of mixed up. And then he says, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Just the sentence is kind of a body of death, you know. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, who has delivered me from this place of, I forget how it ends there, death. This place of death. Paul says, but if we, if it, but... If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can someone say there is no resurrection from the dead? Now, why would this be a point that Paul's coming to? Well, just a little conjecture here. This is not something you turn to a place and it tells you exactly why. Yet we've read some texts. Te we see the reason is because they're immature and so forth. But they've also drifted. These cause them to drift. So if, even if they're, they're not, if, if they are Christians born again of the Spirit, they're still, you can still be an immature Christian who when soon as you open your mouth, you wonder, what faith is that you're espousing? And so as a result, he's not necessarily preaching to someone who, in the time he was in Corinth, did not come to a true conversion by the gospel being spoken to them. But somehow their experience of what took place and their conversion began to override the truth of what happened to them. You've often said, uh, in fact, I, there's, a, there's a methodology that I don't believe in, and that is in many churches, they get as many people in as they can by all kinds of means. Great speaker, you know, some, a football player, whatever it is. They get all these people in there, and then they give them the gospel, and they say, Jesus died for your sins and he rose from the dead, and let's just give him a full, um, full positive marks. You all believe that? And then, no, 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 don't try to answer. If you believe that, then we consider you're born again. We consider you're born again. And then you say to them, well, that doesn't seem like a very good explanation. Anybody quite understand? I mean, it's like saying, you know, just sign the thing and then we'll tell you what it's about. You know, the doll. I don't know who said that. 
kind of don't. I do, really. But and then we say, and then they'll say, well, but our, our, we're getting them in. We're gathering them in with the, the, the shepherd's hook. And then we're going to pastor them by the shepherd's crook. You know, the crook and the hook. The crook is the part of it that you discipline with the food. You teach them. You teach sheep where to go. And, blah, blah, blah. and, and I also think, that's a, what's interesting, that was Robert Schuller's mode of operation. Problem was, never got around to the crook very well. We have a discipleship class. They literally have, we're having 10,000 people come for services, one after the next. Saturday night, all the way through Sunday. Drive in in your pajamas. Get the pancakes first. Come in, sit there like you're in a drive-in movie and pull up the speaker and let the whole family hear the word of God. And all these people came. And they said, we have the, all these people are getting saved. But we're gonna, we disciple all these people. Well, I went to a conference and I went to one of the church services and I went to one of the discipleship meetings. There's nobody there. There weren't, there weren't like... 50,000 people, they were not, there were hardly anybody. There's like maybe 30 people, and they're already saved. And they're all griping about how no one ever comes. They have had home groups. They, of course, you've got to have home groups. You're a church, you've got to have small groups. They had small groups all organized all across the city. And I met with the person who's giving this big lecture about home groups and small groups and how important they are. And I said, how many people compared to Sundays come to small groups? And he goes, that's the real problem around here. No one seems to be really committed to it. So your hook is working, but your crook is not working. Paul is applying the crook to the hook, people. If, I, if it is preached that Christ has been risen from the dead, then how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? They thought Jesus had already come. It's this whole eschatology problem that exists in Corinth. Paul has told them that you have eternal life from now till eternity. You have eternal life. And all the benefits of heaven are yours. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, that makes Jesus is already here among us, too. The, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses think Jesus came back already. They think he lives in is it Brooklyn, New York. He's there. He came back. Already, he's here. He's already set up his kingdom. The kingdom of God. He set up the kingdom of God. He's at the head. We believe that. How can you say, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Because it's at the center. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified. It is our foundational testimony that God had raised Christ from the dead. I have heard people say that have been in other denominations and churches. One person in particular, I'm thinking of very, he was a very studious man all the way till his death in his 90s a very dedicated Christian, but I remember the first day that he was here in this church some 35 years before, sitting right about where Dion's sitting, right about there. In fact, he's right next to you, Dion. See? <laughs> and he said to me, after hearing a sermon about you must, not from me, but from the pastor, you must be born again, he said to me, I have been in this church since I was a little boy and in every service, so we are very dedicated, and I've never heard that before in my whole life. Never heard you must be born again. In fact, the idea of being born again is just one of those born-againers. They put it in category. Well, you're one of those born-againers. Exactly. Because our testimony about God is that he was raised from the dead. Now you may think that's an embarrassing question to ask somebody. Do you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Just let me, just, you believe Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, you're going to see all kinds of roots come out. Some people that do believe that. Some people that, no, I don't even believe that, you know. Well, you'll get it. But it's just a simple gospel. And he says, we have founded our testimony or testified Testimony is telling about what it is that I believe in. 
Some people say, well, Paul's testimony is going along a road, you know, and you know, light came, fell off his horse. Yeah, that's his testimony. But what's most so significant about his testimony? He says, who are you, Lord? Paul knew Jesus was crucified. He knew he was buried. He knew there's this rumor of him being raised from the dead that he didn't believe in. And he then was trying to destroy the church of all Christians who did believe it. When he asked that question, who are you, Lord? He said, I am, present tense, Jesus. What is that? What's, what's the assumption making about that? He's risen from the dead. <laughs> what do you think he's going to say? Woo, I saw him. Huh? No, he saw him risen. He, he says that in his testimony, remember? He says, and I, as one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. Well, Paul didn't. Save Jesus, he heard a voice. Did it make any difference whether he saw him physically or heard that voice? Did you ever see Jesus? Yet you believe in the resurrection. It doesn't add anything if you could see Jesus. Everything, everybody thinks it's going to add something. You know, if you could just show me Jesus alive right now, right now, then I will believe in Jesus. And I've said to people, you wouldn't believe in Jesus if he was standing here. You wouldn't believe it. Because you can't believe it until you're awakened by the gospel, by the Holy Spirit to this truth. But it's this testimony said about God that he was raised from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, see how it goes? For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. We're false teachers, and you're still in your sins. Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died in faith, have died to death. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are all people most to be pitied. You know what Paul said in Thessalonians? He said he talked about this issue of the resurrection. And he, and he talked about the hope that people have, the hope the world has. They have, the, they have the hope that, you know, in this life is the all I got. It's the existential life, existential life. As long as I have life, then I can be okay. I'll be okay. But if I die, then I'm not sure what happens after that. Or in some people, I'm very sure what happens after that. We're, biologically, we just go, bing, start rotting. We're just gone. That's the hope. Isn't that great hope? Paul says the world has no hope. And if we have no resurrection, we have no hope either. If Christ has not been risen from the dead, we don't have anything to hope in. It's a false hope. And people who died in faith believing that, it's a, they're, just in, they're gone. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came, now here's a wonderful, wonderful thing for us to know. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Now, who would that be? A man lost it, death came. And then another man came, and his death, through his death and resurrection, came another reality. Now, in case before you start guessing, in verse 22, for as in Adam all die. Adam was the federal head of all mankind. All mankind wasn't born, but he, was, he, he saw the, the animals reproducing. God said, be fruitful and multiply. And he and we, we Eve, Where's Marcia? We said. What's woven into that is that, that all men, everyone born from him, he was responsible. His lordship over all the creation was placed federally, uh, legally in his hands. He's going to refer to that here in a moment. Legally in his hands. And when he broke the covenant that he did, the covenant of works, he died. He himself started to die. Eve started to die. When they had children, they started to die. 
And we think we started to die. Actually, they were born dead. And they manifest life until a certain point, and then they start going back, and guess where they end up? They die. All persons in Adam, in Adam, in his federal headship, die. So in Christ, all we made alive. But each in his turn, Christ the first fruits, then we who he comes for, then, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when, his, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. You remember the past passage in Hebrews where he says that he talks about mankind. Mankind was a little lower than the angels, but they were given authority over all things. But yet, it, there was a failure. And he said, and now we see Christ. And Christ has now been given dominion over a kingdom. Federally, legally, forensically, he's the federal head over his kingdom. And we who are dead come to life through him and his death. He's the first to rise. We rise after him. Where was he raised from? From the grave. In that grave where he absorbed or swallowed up our sins. Your sins, my sins, every single one of them. And he then rose in victory and brought us with him. We're risen with him, Paul is saying. Jesus must reign. He must reign until he has put all his men enemies under his feet. As Adam was to reign and put all things under himself in his failure, he lost that, and Jesus has come and regained it. And as a result, he is putting all things under his feet. Now, of course, that's talking about the gathering of those people who belong to him. In the 17th chapter, he made the, made the case as he prayed for the disciples that would be effective and they would, he would, they would be protected and they would bear the message that they heard. He says, you've shown me your glory, I've shown your glory to them. You've shown me my mission, I've shared my mission. Now it's their mission. Remember that exchange in that beautiful passage in the 17th chapter of John? And he says, but Lord, I don't only pray for them. These right here. These, he says. I pray for all those who will believe because of them. And so we see Jesus extending his kingdom, not just on, in, in the... In the context of his own world we see him extending it to the future until he brings all those who are lost they're still under the death of Adam when, he, when all those people are brought into his kingdom in, in Psalm 8 verse 6 it talks about Adam's um, federal head, head, headship but here Paul doesn't apply it to Adam he says they read the part about last enemy doing destroy his death. Yes, twenty seven. For he has put everything under his feet. God has put everything under Jesus' feet. They were under Adam's feet in Psalm chapter eight, verse six. But now Paul, you read sometime, he says, "Well, that's not what it's about. It's not about Jesus." Well, it may not have been about Jesus then. But now in Christ, it becomes about Jesus, just as it was in Hebrews, where this redefinition of the person Adam who failed, but the person Christ who does not fail. And the result is Adam brought the whole, his whole dominion into death. Jesus brings his whole dominion into eternal life. He has put everything under his feet, Christ's feet. Just a little parenthetical thought. Now, when it says everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. <laughs> Why? Jesus isn't God. He's a man. He had to be a man, right? Now, he's an incarnate God in that he shares his, his body with the word of God. But Jesus is not going to be put above God. He's in God, and he takes this proper role of being in God. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Just a little parenthetical thought. Don't think that Jesus is now God and the Trinity is going to worship him. That's going to still remain as it is, 
but he's going to take this place. And John sees heaven, and he sees the, the throne of God, the Father. He sees the Word of God. He sees the spirits flying around the, the throne. It's all metaphorical language. And then he sees a fourth thing. He sees one who is like a, sl a lamb slain. The one who is Jesus Christ. The one who is in God. And we are in Christ. And so therefore we are in God. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, now it's two minutes till 12. I said to myself when I started working on this, this is going to be another sermon. I am pretty sure it is. So we're going to end here at verse 28, okay, just for today. And let me give some concluding thoughts. Again, the importance of the resurrection. And then this new information. He's seeing people that need information. Just giving them that Jesus rose from the dead, do you believe that? That's not literally, that's not enough information for a person who is in Christ. And it should not be taken as, well, I have enough information. In fact, I, I think I understand as well as Paul does. Then we have the same problem they did. They're not, they're not getting into the depths of this. And as I said, the distinction between teaching is just giving the facts Preaching is when you exhort, when you admonish, when you, do you have it, do you understand it? You know, the, the whole Philip along the side of the Ethiopian, do you understand what you're reading about? He says, how can I unless somebody teaches me? And so the process that Paul is saying is the thing you've lost, the way you're drifted, is you've drifted away even an interest in this. Now I tend to have a interest in things that I've, sometimes I find myself going places that there's no answer for. You know, when we did this in a Bible study at one point, when we talked about how was Mary conceived? Well, she was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And I said, I, what I'm going to say, talk, I'm not trying to tell you that I'm going to tell you something that's in the Bible. But I believe that somewhere Somehow the Holy Spirit produced a human seed and put in Mary. And first part, <laughs> love Randy Pullen. John, where does it say that in the Bible? And I said, well, I, did, I told you, this does not appear in the Bible. It's just, I'm following the ball, I think. And so, <laughs> we just start back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm just trying to get this out, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're adding to the scripture, you're adding to the scripture, you know the whole thing. And my brother Tim, who's in our Bible studies in Texas, I saw him just, his little, little thing on the Zoom you have, it goes, mute. <laughs> and, uh, and so we finally got through this when I said, okay, you're right, I, I'm sorry I even brought this up, please forgive me. And um, then Tim goes, unmute. And then we continued, right? But I remember from that place, going into my bathroom and looking at myself in the mirror and I said, Father, I know that it's not written in the Bible, but I don't think the Apostle Paul had any knowledge of microbiology at all. But if he did, I think we would hear about it. But we do, I said, and so he doesn't even himself know. Luke didn't have any, any, any Luke's a doctor. He didn't say, well, he didn't have the, in, the inquisitiveness that I'm sharing. And I said, and all I said is, all I want to know is, I want to know. And I think I heard, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> or something like that, you know. It's, because you, you can take things to the point where you're just preaching, a, you're, you're preaching, you think you're preaching about the gospel, you preach something, and I just did it. So here we go. No wonder I'm stopping, because I... You know, and I didn't conclude anything, did I? Other than to simply say that more information is needed, and Paul knows that, for him, them to have a full assurance. All it takes to break us in our beliefs is someone who comes up and asks us questions that we don't know how to answer. Peter says, be prepared to answer questions when people ask you questions. 
I don't know if it's going to be the resurrection or this, but the reality is that we need to be prepared, and Paul is preparing them even at a deeper level, as you can see him going. And in verse 24, is that where we ended? Thank you, 28. For, or when he had done this. That's where we'll end today. And I would like to, I'd like to emphasize something that I probably read again. And that is that Paul's, sorry, I thought I had an eight-page sermon. I actually have 16 pages because I duplicated it, unfortunately. Um, this is a firm foundation. It's one of the firm foundations. And it was planned by God before the foundation of the earth. It was established by God in the fiber of all creation. It was revealed by God in all history by the redemptive unfolding of Jesus Christ. Precision is needed for a plant to grow. Not only a lot of sun, a lot of air, but also fertilizing and sometimes pruning. When all these features are present in a tree, it grows. The same is true for the Christian life. Paul has set before the Corinthians and us a banquet of truth regarding the foundational truth of the resurrection of Christ. These are not just principles. He's talking about a person. The resurrection is a discussion about a person the person of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished. In John chapter 11, at the tomb of Lazarus, Martha and Mary, Mary first, Martha then, they went out to you know, kind of rebuke Jesus a little bit. And that would, it was a common statement. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again at the resurrection of the last day, our resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. The one who believes in me will live. It's not enough to believe in a resurrection principle. Do you believe in a principle level that Jesus rose from the dead? It's not enough. He rose from the dead. He is the resurrection and he is the life. All things come from him and through him and by him. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never not die. And notice what he says this. Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe in me? And you, and you believe in what I'm going to do. Of course, she didn't know what he's going to do yet. Don't believe in me just because I did, you know, raise somebody else. I'm going to be raised. And here is the key to the whole thing. We put our trust, our intellectual trust, in Jesus Christ, who we believe rose from the dead and is now at the right hand of God making mediation for us as our intercessor. Glory, glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name. Amen. He that hath an ear, let him hear. In Jesus' name, amen.